So my area of research is tropical ecology, which you wouldn't believe looking around me at the snow. Uh, in fact, I'm a climate change expert and my concern for climate, my work in tropical rainforest has also brought me to work on Canadian climate policy. I will be talking about those two topics in my mini science talk. Um, I will try to bring a new angle. Most people think about climate change as something very depressing. And I'm going to stress the progress that are being made. I'm going to talk about advances in reducing deforestation uh, in tropical countries. And I will also talk about a way forward for Canada to become a leader in terms of climate change mitigation. Climate change is really a global problem. You can work from it in the tropics with the forest. You can work from it in countries like Canada, Norway, Germany, uh, because the carbon dioxide that's causing it, it's mixed in the atmosphere. A misconception currently is that people are thinking that countries in the developing world are not doing their share in terms of climate action. So I will show how Brazil, for example, has been able to reduce deforestation in the Amazon by more than 70%. Uh, we feel it's very important to come across and show the successes because it is this sense of doom and gloom that there is no hope and that people don't know how to tackle climate change that is fostering apathy. So all of my talk is a sort of a prep, you know, to, to show that in fact climate change uh, offers the opportunity for societies to transition to a better place to live and it's not just about pain it's also about opportunity the title of this mini science series of course is weather and climate going to extremes so we've gone to extremes in all the weather <laughs> my speaker is Catherine Potvin who's a professor in the department of biology at McGill University Catherine is a Quebecoise from near Mark Farnham in southern Quebec she has an undergraduate and master's degree from the University of Montreal and she did a PhD from Duke University, which is based in North Carolina. She's an extensive researcher on plant ecology, both in temperate regions, but particularly in tropical regions. And she's affiliated with the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute, which is based in Panama. She's published extensively in terms of her research in terms of plant ecology. And also she's a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada and a Canada Research Chair at McGill University. Catherine? I really want to stress that my lab, my grad student, they developed a motto for the lab, which is science for empowerment. And I hope that I will show you why we, the students chose that. Um, in my group, we're very concerned with climate change. And we try, we position ourselves into looking for solutions. And we work in Canada, we work in Panama. I'm actually flying to Panama tomorrow. It will be lovely. I know there will be no snow. Uh, and so I'm going to start there, um, and I'm going to bring you to the work we do in Panama first, and then, you know, explain how we then began to be involved in Canada. So the background is climate change. I'm sure you all know this. You all know that the atmospheric concentration of CO2 is increasing. But on that graph that is, I assume, quite uh, familiar, you see a little red line that oscillates. It goes up and down. And this is the pleasure of biologists. When the little line is down, there is less CO2 in the atmosphere. This corresponds to the summer of the northern hemisphere. It is the signature of our forest. Our forests are taking up the CO2. They're, they're storing it. And they manage to actually leave a signature globally on the atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide. And in winter, when our trees lose leaf, carbon dioxide goes up. And that is the little oscillation. I love it because it comforts me as a plant biologist that the trees with whom I work are really important. So when we try to understand uh, climate change, we, uh, we look at the global carbon cycle. So where is carbon? How is carbon dioxide produced in the atmosphere? 
When we're in Montréal, a day like today, we know cars are important, we know it comes from industrial process, and that it's linked to fossil fuel combustion. But deforestation or land use change, the way we use the forest, the way we do agriculture, is also a very important component of this, uh, this global carbon cycle. And I'm not an engineer, I'm a biologist, so that's really where I work. So my main research, my expertise, the work I do for now, over 10, 20 years, I started to work in Panama in 1993, and somehow I'm always gone in January, I wonder why. Um, so I work, I work on trees, I work on, on deforestation, so why is deforestation so important? Because half of the biomass, or half of the weight, if you prefer, of a tree is carbon. In the tropics, a very standard process or procedure is to cut the forest and burn the trees. The, there is not necessarily a big forest industry for timber. What is the interest is very often land for agriculture. And so the best way to get rid of a big tree like the one on that picture is indeed you cut it and you burn it, then it's gone, you don't have to do anything with it. So there is an international um, mechanism that we nickname RED for reducing emissions from forest degradation and deforestation. This is a mechanism in the Climate Change Convention, the International Climate Change Convention. Uh, and it, the way it works is to say if industrialized country wants to compensate their emission, they can team up with developing nations where we have tropical forest, and developing countries would give money to develop, developed countries, sorry, would give money to developing country and help them reduce deforestation. So that provides a context for the work in my research group. Uh, we've started to work with indigenous people in Panama in the beginning of the 1990s, and I think this little animation that's done by one of my grad student, he is the top, on the top uh, pictures here, sorry, um, will show you why we work with indigenous people. So this is a map of Panama. Uh, Panama is, of course, a Central American country with borders with Colombia and with Costa Rica. And in green on this map, you have the forest cover. Panama is a, a magnificent country for a terrestrial biologist. It still has about 60% of the country in primary forest. So that's like the gold for us, like primary forest. The blue lines on the map, they delineate indigenous territory. Panama is quite special. They've actually settled land rights to indigenous people. In Panama, we have 13% of the population that are indigenous, and they control 25% of the territory, which is more than their share, okay? So just have a look and see that, especially in eastern Panama, the forest is very much found where we have indigenous people. So this is uh, data that comes from Panama's official map of forest of 1992. And I recommend you, you look around here for Cam, Cameron's mom. That's where he got sick. That's a, a mother in the room of a student that was quite sick uh, with amoebas drinking non drinkable water just a few weeks ago. Uh, he's fine. And the mother too, I hope. Um, so it, this is a very interesting region for us because it's an, a region of very active um, land use change, deforestation, a, a lot is going on. So this is how it looked like in 1992, 2000, and 2008. And if I clicked to bring us to today, you would see that the forest is in Panama is almost only remaining in indigenous territory and inside national park. Almost everywhere else, the forest is gone. So in my research group, we therefore work with indigenous people as a main, uh, our main partner because in essence, we are interested with the same thing, which is protecting the forest. So 
I chose to just give you a bit of glimpse of the sort of things that my grad students are doing, since I'm really not doing anything except giving talks anymore. Now and then I still go to the field. So a very interesting project that we did uh, is we teamed up with uh, uh, scientists from the Carnegie uh, Institution in, in California. He operates an airplane, and this airplane is equipped with a special um, instruments, we call it a LIDAR. It's, a, it's a similar a bit to a radar. It, it's um, an instrument that sends a pulse of light and then calculates the return time of the light to the airplane. And as the airplane is flying over a forest, it can measure the height of the canopy because, of course, if the beam is, is hitting the top of a tree, it will take less time for the beam to get back to the airplane. So we, we consider this is like the very best technology. It's, it's the most sophisticated way to measure the height of a forest. Um, I started by showing this slide of the carbon cycle, right? So for me, one of the main, our main endeavor is to know how much carbon is, it, is there in a forest and how fast is it disappearing? We need that to calibrate the global carbon cycle and actually measure this increase in carbon dioxide. But think about it just a minute. How difficult it is to know how much carbon is there in a forest. I said the carbon is the weight of a tree. Well, I cannot go in a forest and cut the tree, bring that on a scale to know its weight, right? We, we cannot do that. We would be destroying the forest that we're trying to preserve. So we need to find indirect ways to measure the forest carbon stock. And that technology, the LIDAR, is pretty much, you know, the, the, you know again, the, the, the most sophisticated method we know. So in my group, we work with indigenous people. And so with uh, Greg Asner, the, the owner of this plane, we developed a project by which his airplane would fly over indigenous territory. All these color um, area, they are different indigenous territories, and the red line are the paths of the airplane. So his work was to fly over the forest and estimate carbon from above, and my work was actually to go in the forest and verify if his airplane was giving a real answer or was lying. So I will actually bring you to Panama now, uh, with a little video, I'm sure you'll, you'll appreciate and maybe you'll feel a bit warmer for a while. <laughs> In the context of climate change, there is this huge interest to stop deforestation. And again, if indigenous people in Panama, they control 60% of primary forests, they will be key actors for this you know, agenda of conserving the forest. So about three years ago, we started a large program of training of technicians, indigenous chiefs and technicians on this proposal. It's a big territory, 200,000 hectares. Last year, a scientist from um, California, Dr. Greg Asner, he flew over this landscape with a plane and he measured carbon with what we scientists consider probably one of the most advanced technology. So we're currently establishing the line along a plot of one hectare that correspond exactly to uh, one hectare that has been measured by the LiDAR plane um, because we want to validate the data of the LiDAR uh, with the people from the community because for them, uh, in order to, to actually believe that this plane that takes data from the sky is taking data that are meaningful, they really need to, to see a part of that for themselves. And then within that forest measure the height of trees and their diameter as well as the species identification. 
55.8. These are the three elements that we actually need to estimate the carbon, the above ground carbon stock as we say it. 64.1. Altura. We're sort of a you know, acting as a bridge between this really high-tech technology and their belief system and their understanding of the, their own you know, forested landscape. So I guess with that, that little video, you've, you've understood that maybe the trademark in my group is all the work we do, we do with, with technicians that are indigenous. So we train the people, we explain the issue, and then we go out with them and they take the measurement. And what's fabulous that's emerging from that is then it, you know, they, they become able to understand the way you know, international negotiation function. It, it brings them to an understanding of how we consider carbon and, and we also get to learn the way they appreciate the forest. Which is why, again, in my lab, they, they decided that our motto was science for empowerment. So it's, it's been a very privileged uh, interaction that we've developed over the years in Panama with that. So if this red mechanism would come true, there would be money flowing, say, from Canada to Panama to, well, there's still, there apparently is, but that's not the same kind of money. Okay, money flowing from Canada <laughs> to Panama, to the community, to protect carbon, okay? Uh, all very controlled. And uh, our work is to try and see that, of course, it would have an impact on, um, you know, conserving the forest, but it would be um, equally important that this money helps to improve the livelihood of people. We're talking of indigenous people that live in, you know, quite poor conditions. So one of the questions that we've addressed, besides just the technology of measuring carbon, is can red improve livelihoods of rural community? And here we partnered with the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute. It's, an, it's a, a great uh, research institute, a, a partner for McGill. And they decided to offset their emissions. So they decided to go carbon neutral. So they made an inventory of their emissions. They tried to reduce their emission, and then they decided to buy carbon credit to, to be zero emissions. Uh, a great model. So they chose to work in a village um, doing both reforestation and avoiding deforestation for this. So there was actually a financial transaction and a contract. And we were brought in to, to again, do the monitoring of, of carbon stocks. So, what we did is worked with people to create agroforestry systems, so planting crop trees, as well as protecting uh, the forest that, they, that these indigenous people had on their land. The agroforestry work was beaut a beautiful success. Within a year, the people who reforested on their land, they were able to establish little uh, kiosks to sell produce on the main road. So it became both something good for the environment, storing carbon, and good for their economy, selling fruit. So a big success, a, a very good, you know, a very good part of the project. The other, other landowner in that um, community decided to protect the forest, and that ended up being a complete failure to our great, great surprise, because we thought it was easy. If, if you say, I'm going to protect my forest, well, then you just protect your forest. And, and that apparently was not the case. You see a, li a little sign here that says uh, zone of study, and it has all sorts of logo. McGill is one, but the Ministry of Environment of Panama is another one. And behind that, it's a slash and burn. It's not because we actually put the sign in a slash and burn, no, we did not. When we put the sign, it was in front of a forest. And four months later, we came and the forest had been completely cut down. And so we then started to realize that our vision of the land and of land use was way too narrow. We were working with one actor, they were the indigenous people that owned the territory, and we forgot that they had neighbors and their neighbors were farmer. And these farmers, what they love is cows. And so when they saw this forest, they thought, oh, that forest would become so beautiful if only we could cut it, burn it, and put a cow, which is actually what they did. So that brought us to start to work in understanding the worldview and understanding 
what different groups of people really want uh, and need in order to live happy, and how can we integrate that into strategies for protecting land use. So we developed an intersectorial board. We brought the cattle rancher on board, the reforestation guy, the indigenous people, even the police, uh, to try to, to come up with strategy and conflict resolution. And this has been four or five years, and we're still struggling with that. Why am I bringing a kind of a semi-failure result here? I think it's to drive the point that stopping deforestation is immensely difficult. We are talking of countries where we have lots of landless peasants. These people are poor, and they legitimately want to improve their life. And the way that the tradition tells them is to improve your life. You cut the forest, you put cows, a cow makes a calf, and then you soon have four or five, and then you sell them and you make money. So there's a good economic sense in their desire to cut the forest. But for Panama, it's a problem because it's the major source of carbon dioxide emission. So it's their oil sand, if you want. So it's difficult to act on something like that. Um, and I want to share a really exciting result. And it's not Greenpeace that I'm citing here. It's a bit old, but if you go on the website, you see that the results are the same. It's an article that was published in 2013 in The Economist, and it's about Brazil. So we all hear that the Amazon is all up in flame and it's being devastated and so on. And basically, the situation that I described in Panama is very similar to what's happening in Brazil, or what was happening in Brazil. In 2009, the then President Lula committed Brazil to reduce deforestation by 80% in 2020. Okay? And now you understand a bit more the complexity of that topic. Well, look at these little green square. Every little green square is a thousand square kilometer and of deforestation. So the figure shows you how much deforestation has reduced in Brazilian Amazon? They have reduced deforestation by more than 70%. And they're right on target, going to be able to say, to do what they said they would. So in some country, there are policies that work. And for Brazil, it's extremely important. Deforestation, like in Panama, is the main source of carbon dioxide. So for me, that was an amazing lesson to see countries that advance, which then brings me to Canada. OK, Canada has changed since last fall. But still, still, last year, which is the most recent assessment of Canadian climate change policy, Canada was ranked 58 out of 61 country, our friend neighbor being Saudi Arabia. So we have hope that the next year, when Canadian climatic policy will be evaluated, we will we'll have leaped forward. But we still are a country that has had immense failure in terms of tackling climate change. So because I spend all my time in the tropic, I have, and I'm a scientist, right? So I work with hypothesis. So one hypothesis is, are Canadians more dumb than Brazilians? It's a fairly legitimate hypothesis to test. <laughs> or you can try and flip it in another way and say, well, maybe Canadians really don't know how to tackle. And in Panama, that's what we faced. We, we realized how complex this is. So I've been trying to, to think what could we do. And I gathered a group of scholars. And together, we advanced or we, we worked to advance a climate action plan in Canada. I want to step back just a minute because very often, and I think this is plaguing Canada, um, and maybe we can have another hypothesis, maybe Brazilians are more optimistic than Canadian. Because when you talk to people in Canada, the answer is very generally, nothing can be done. It's too complicated. And that is the perfect excuse for not doing anything. Because what, why would you bother doing something if anyway it's, it's not useful? It's too late. We can't do it, it's too complicated. So we 
worked with the Consortium Uranos, they advised the Quebec government on climate change, and we simulated future scenario for Canada, just to kind of get a sense of how things would look like. So this is uh, the report of the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Their last report dates 20, uh, 30, 2013. They propose different climate change scenario for the future, some that can lead to a warming of about two degrees globally or up to four degrees globally. You've heard that because this two and four, it comes all the time. So this is what it would look like for Canada. So this map, these two maps, they are showing you the difference in temperature in Canada at the beginning and end of this century. The greenish is about two degree increase and the dark red is 14 degree increase, okay? So this is the Canada of, oh, it's really too complicated, we cannot do anything. And this is the Canada of, okay, we are smart, as smart as the Brazilians, and we're gonna start and work, and we're going to make our share of this you know, challenge and be successful. I'm a multi-grandmother, three, four in the making, and I really want this for them. This, yeah, I'm, I'm sure some other people must be grandparents in this audience. So to me, this goes without say. We have a moral obligation to, to do everything we can to reach this. And so uh, with my colleagues, that's what we aim to do. So we gathered a group of scholars from all 10 provinces. So we're 60 crazy people. Uh, the characteristic is every one of us, we've always worked on sustainability issues. But we come from different fields. We have business, that's really important. We have engineers, also important. But we also have sociologists, super important, and philosophers, because it's, uh, it's the society that we need to transform. And we cannot just transform that with engineer. It has to be, you know, uh, you know looking for the future Canada. So um, my colleagues also, we have some colleagues that work in the, in the, in the north. So a very good group of, of scholars, and we've worked for two years to write a climate action plan for Canada. Um, we aimed at launching that a year ago. It was la launched in March, one month before, maybe you remember the first summit of prime minister provincial, and the minister, federal minister at the time did not even go to attend that, that summit. Um, and we worked with all federal party minus one who never answered our emails as we were building this climate action plan. What we wanted was to give tools to the federal parties as they were developing their platform so that the level of all parties would increase in terms of their climate change mitigation. We, we did do this work only scholars it was a time where there was a lot of discussion about scientists not being heard. So for us, it was important as scientists to speak in one voice. But as soon as we launched, we distributed widely this report to civil society, from business to First Nation, and told people, please give us feedback. What do you like or what don't you like about the climate change plan that we, we developed? And we had 28 different uh, groups that answered us. I understand that the links to both reports is, uh, is on the site here of Mini Science. So we had 28 different groups that answered us. First Nation did. Unifor is an interesting one. It's the union of the oil sand worker. Okay, so, so that, that was very important for us. And this is UN Global Compact their environment committee, so it's a, it's a group of very big business, and the environmental committee of UN Global Compact uh, asked for member Enbridge and Bell Canada, and they actually also answered us. So, so we've been able to, to get quite a large spectrum of views on climate change. Uh, so I'm going to sort of summarize some of the key, key recommendation or key input. Um, of course, we're in Quebec, so we know that the carbon price is part of the policies we have to do. It's not so obvious if you're in other provinces. 
So for us, it's an important first step. It's important because um, it's just like the cigarettes. If you are putting a price on cigarettes, then you collect a revenue that you can apply to hospital to cure the people who've been smoking. So it's, you know, it's, it's just a normal polluter pay principle. Uh, where we, I think we're a bit more contributing something novel, uh, is we've been arguing that the transition in Canada should really rely on electricity, which again in Quebec, we already have that. We already have a low carbon electricity, but Ontario is struggling th this way. Saskatchewan, Alberta, why is that important? Well, we believe, and I'll show you, oh, I think I'll show you just right now. Um, that in Canada we are, and I'm quoting Mr. Harper, a super energy power. <laughs> the only thing Mr. Harper didn't factor in is we're not just a super power for oil. We actually are a super power for renewable energy. So this is um, a map of renewable energy in Canada. Uh, in, green, uh, in yellow, orange, it's solar, and in green, it's wind. And for you to have a kind of a scale of perspective of the potential of Canada, look at Ontario. Ontario has a solar potential equal to that of Germany. And Germany is a country who decided that they will get all of their electricity from solar. And so compare what Alberta and Saskatchewan have, superpower in renewable. So what we're arguing is that the way forward for Canada is to make electricity be low carbon all around the country. It's easy, we think, you know, all, we have electricity everywhere. It would develop a lot of new job in the renewable energy sector. And then from, from that, we can start and shift the, you know, shift the transition away from fossil fuel. The other flip side of the coin is to look at energy, uh, of course, look at you know, oil and gas and, you know, develop the national energy strategy. Uh, the discussion here I have to start uh, relatively soon. If we then turn to the consumption of energy in Canada, look at this graph. It's data from Environment Canada. The bulk of our energy comes from gas and oil. Despite the fact that we have a lot of renewable electricity already, like in Quebec. So we really have to make this substitution uh, of the oil and gas sector. And this will come, we think, by mainly tackling transportation. Transportation is the only sector where we are 100% almost, you know, based on, on fossil fuel. But to resolve transportation, we argue that we need to start to consider land use planning. Because transportation is not just switching you to an electric car. It's actually that you have less to travel, that things are near you, okay? So, so it's rethinking the cities in a way that, you know, you have the commerce nearby, you are living near your work, so that the amount of transportation that you need to do be reduced. Land use planning is also very important if we want to maximize our capacity for buildings to switch to renewable energy. So we need, for example, solar passive building, buildings where the sun can heat it in winter so that your cost for, um, you, know, it, you know, heating cost electricity lowers down. So there is a lot of work to be done at the level of municipality rethinking the building and the transportation sector. One of the key, I think, element of our proposal was to remind people that it will not be done tomorrow. Because that's what people say often, is oh, besides that it's too complicated, we cannot do anything, is we don't know. And we say, yeah, absolutely, we don't know. I think we know how to get to about 2025, 2030, with the technology we have, with the renewable and the electricity. And then we don't know and it doesn't matter. Many of you remember, for example, the 1990s. Okay, the 1990s, they're 25 years ago. Well, in the 1990s, um, I spent a year in Paris and to communicate with my friend, I was writing letters. I was mailing the letters. 
It took 10 days for her to get my letter and she answered. And it took 10 days, uh, three weeks to know she had met a guy. Ooh. <laughs> now it's instantaneous on Facebook. But in 1990, we had no idea Facebook would exist. We had no idea Skype existed. So it's normal that we don't know. But if we create the conditions for industry to kick in, the innovation we need will get there. So it's about transitioning. It's about changing a course and a pathway. And it doesn't matter that we don't know how. What's important is to start to change now. And we also think that the change, it needs to be built on the desire of people. And that transitioning an entire country to low carbon is a fabulous opportunity for resolving other problems. Like, I personally, I don't like traffic jam. I don't have a car, so I bike, so I'm usually I'm off that. But anytime I'm in a traffic jam, it irritates me. I think that climate change should help address that, okay? So by relooking at the design of, of cities. So some of my students, they looked at studies that have been done across Canada that capture the dreams of Canadians for the future. And those dreams are telling us that Canadians want close-knit community where people engage, where that are safe. They want green infrastructure, good public transportation, and they want to protect the landscape and the water. They want to have green parks, okay? So these are elements that can be the motor of the transition that we're looking for. And that should inform where we're going. It's very important for us. It's a notion of what we call regenerative sustainability. At UBC, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say that we're at McGill, but at UBC, they have a building that actually produce so much energy that it's not only self-sufficient, it's sending energy to the next building for its heating. That's where we need to go. We need to go in a place where not only we stop to do harm, but we actually fix things. And we know how to do that. In Montreal, for example, all the beautiful flowers of the city, they make things nicer. That's a way to fix things, right? So, it's very important that this transition, we stop to see that as a pain, a burden, a difficulty, uh, you know, something that's going to be terrible. And we start to dream about where it can bring us. And this is my granddaughter. And if I'm here and if I've done this work, it's because I can only imagine the following. She's a really little She's a little brain. She's really smart and asking questions all the time. So I imagine in 20 years from now, when she's going to be 20 something, and she's going to say, hmm, Grandma, weren't you like a famous climate change scholar? And I would say, oh, yes, and I wrote paper, like what Tim said, right? And then it would be havoc. And then she would say, and then Grandma, what did you do? And I'd say, oh, I published papers, you know? So that wouldn't qualify very much indeed. So I think that the time now is for action and that it's really important that we kind of leave the suffering and, and the pain and be as smart as the Brazilian and say, okay, we have a, you know, we have a good challenge and there's nothing like a challenge to, to build a country and give hope to the people. So thank you. So please pass your Thank questions you. through. So uh, I've got a couple of questions, Catherine. That video you showed when you were going to the Embarra, were you wearing makeup? What was that blue stuff? Was it a tattoo or what? How long does it last? What does your children think about that, your grandchildren, when you see you looking that strange color? Yeah, so this is a plant called, the Latin name is Genipa Americana, and it's the traditional body painting of, um, two of the nations of Panama indigenous people. And the one people with whom I've worked for the longest, they are the, the people that owns territory at the border of Colombia. They traditionally paint themselves blue from the fore and all the body. And if you've looked at my arm, they have very nice uh, geometric design. And I've always liked that. I'm really white. <laughs> and they have much nicer colors, at least when I'm blue. Uh, I don't look so white. Uh, and so, yeah, it's just fashion, different kind of fashion. 
So it lasts about three weeks. Okay, three. And then it goes away? I mean, it Yeah, it, it off. washes away. It wash, it, it's, it's not good looking at the end. Okay. It just looks dirty. <laughs> Second, my second question is, we talked to Nigel Rule, who'd actually dealt with politicians in Ontario in terms of the Northern project for Ontario. And we asked him questions about how do you get the attention of politicians? Now, you worked for the Panama government in terms of the COP presentation, in terms of bread. How do you deal with diplomats and scientists and politicians to get them to absorb what you're trying to say? So for, for me, and I guess for my student as well, in university, we're paid to create knowledge. And if this knowledge is important for decision making, then we have a responsibility to take this knowledge and package it in a way that can be understood outside of a lab uh, and share it to policymakers. And we've been very well received everywhere in Panama uh, and in Canada. And I was in Ottawa yesterday. I met the director of policy at the Climate Change and Environment and the director of communication, the, the deputy minister of transport. The, dip, the director of policy for the Minister of Science. So people, our experience is they're happy to listen. They're happy to, you know, they're very, I think, even grateful when you give them knowledge that is useful for them. Okay, so why was Brazil so successful in deforestation? So what, what was the critical elements that produced so, it? So to me, that was a very important question to my Brazilian colleague as we started our Canadian project. And the answer was the Brazilian government, they said we have a major problem, deforestation is killing us. And so they brought to the table the business sector, cattle ranchers, the NGOs, the scholars, and they sat with them and they used all these brains to try and tackle it. And at the same time, the Brazilian government, they have a satellite monitoring. It's called PRODES. You can look at it on the web. And they started every month to put up the figure of deforestation in the Amazon. So everybody was able to click and see the shrinking of the Amazon. And so the combination of public support by people saying, we're destroying our own good, which is this forest, and the many brains trying to find a solution uh, made the difference. So I'm hoping that the federal government will make a table with the oil industry and multi-sector to try and find a solution. In Quebec, that was done for the forestry sector about 20 years ago, and it really helped a lot. So one question I just got here then is that, um, huh, I'm going to find it now, is that evidence of clear-cutting on the Gaspésie, and the question there is how do we discourage clear-cutting in the Grand Caspadi River in the Gaspé. I mean, in, in, a, in a Canadian sense, there's a ways of being able to train, change the way in which we change our land use patterns. Yeah, I'm not uh, familiar with the sort of forest that we have in the Gaspé Z. Um, I, you know, I think that in general, the people that work with forestry in Canada, they say if it's coniferous forest where the normal perturbation is a wide you know, wide, like a wide epidemic or fire, clear cutting isn't that bad. If the forest is um, a forest with uh, deciduous trees like maple and so on, then clear cutting is not appropriate because the normal perturbation of the forest is a small scale, one tree falls down. So the norm, nor the norm of practice of for forestry currently is to mimic the normal uh, perturbation. Now in Quebec, we have a tool, so if Somebody thinks that the forestry practice is not good. We have Le Forestier en Chef. So we have an office now that oversees what is going on. And that office is not receiving, it's not the Ministère des Ressources Naturelles. They're not re receiving any money from the clear cut. So there is a place where we can go and, you know, and, and call for an inquiry. The next question is about hydropower. In Quebec, we're heavily invested in hydroelectric power. And Nigel talked about the carbon emission rates associated with uh, dams, in which he believes is quite efficient in a Canadian sense. He was very wary, though, about dams being created in the tropics, particularly in Brazil. Are there plans, for example, to create hydroelectric dams in Panama as a source of energy? Yes, there is. In fact, in Panama, about 25% of uh, uh, electricity comes from dam, but they're very different. So they are not wide reservoir dams. They are dams on very steep river that creates a very small footprint around the river. So the emissions of methane, that's a concern with tropical dam, is not a 
problem so much in Panama. Okay. So these are all questions about energy sources, okay? <laughs> yeah, well, climate change is a big energy problem. So where do you stand on nuclear energy? I would say that for me, climate change is the enemy number one, of course. I've worked on that all my career. Uh, in Quebec, for example, we have zero reason to, to, to talk about nuclear. We have plenty hydro. Uh, there might be provinces that want to consider nuclear in their portfolio. Japan, France are countries that chose to go for nuclear. Um, Germany has not. So it's a tough balancing act because, of course, we know the danger that comes with nuclear. But I think if you can do without, for sure, you should do without. So you show the pie diagram of the energy sources for Canada, and quite a large chunk of that was natural gas, right? Yeah, natural so, gas. So uh, uh, when you're in your report, have you considered then whether natural gas would be a transition fuel rather no. than being so dependent upon? No, we think this oil? is an extremely big mistake to consider natural gas as a transition because, for example, the commerce that is now on oil and that's going to shift to gas, will not want to then shift to electricity. And so what you want, and it's the same problem to a certain extent with hybrid car. If you're going to take a car, just go to electric, because you won't want to change twice on a short time. So whenever possible, you should leap to the cleanest sort of energy. So it's a big, big, big problem, natural gas. Sorry, gas metro. It's true. <laughs> What about the pipeline debate? I love uh, to talk about pipeline. <laughs> pipelines is not a problem. What's the problem is the relationship of pipelines with, with oil exploitation. So if you're saying science is telling us we need to get out of oil, why do you need a pipeline to expand oil production? You should not. You should rather invest in the transition away from oil. So the pipeline itself is probably not a big impact. What's above, um, above and below the pipeline, you know, the source and the later use are the problems. So the problem we have now is we don't have uh, uh, impact studies that, that look at that, that look at the entire life cycle, which is what we need to consider. And I think it's better to invest somewhere else. Did your group look at the ability of tides to produce power, for example, in the Bay of Fundy? Yeah, the only project in Canada is the Bay of Fundy project that used tidal movement for energy. I think there must be something amazing to do with tide. It never stops. It's all over our coast. So I personally think that it's probably one of those Skype of the future or Facebook of the future that we don't know, but that will come true. Definitely. So another question is, could you give examples of construction norms in indigenous communities, the way in which they could adapt, uh, particularly in the Canadian North, maybe? Yeah, so we're, I'm working with, um, on a new project. It's phase three of Sustainable Canada Dialogue, uh, acting on climate change, innovations from First Nations. So do you know that Canada's most solar community is a Tsuk community of uh, Vancouver Island? And what they want to do is then import their technology, solar, solar technology, to off-the-grid communities. So there are some really cool initiatives, indeed, for uh, um, getting, getting indigenous community off the grid. And so easy to improve their life because their life is so hard. So, so we're going back and forth a bit because the It's questions. like a qualifying exam. They had not told me that. No. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, more, more. There's one, there's the last one's going to be a good one, but anyway. So, so I think one, one of the issues is that what do you do then in Panama whereby you have the people, the colonists, who are wanting to cut down forest to produce then <coughs> food that they can eat and sell versus preserving the forest, which might produce a certain amount of merchantable material, but doesn't really solve people's hunger. I mean, how do you balance those two things out? So um, in Brazil, for example, they've invested a lot into um, agriculture, um, silvopastoral system where you can have trees and cows. Uh, in, in countries where you have a dry season that is prolonged, the cows do better. Uh, you can have grasses that are more productive. In Panama and in general in Latin America, the density is one cow per hectare. Uh, that takes a lot of hectare for, for uh, 
un troupeau, right? So if you could improve the way ranching is done, you could probably use less land and still sustain agricultural production. Yeah. So the Olympics are going to be in Brazil. Do you have any advice for Canadian Olympians in avoiding sunburn or <laughs> insect bites or drinking bad water like the people in the Panama field course? Well, I would say that you need to drink a lot of water and yes, maybe filter it. But yeah, dehydration is certainly the worst enemy when you get to Panama. Uh, you, can you really ask questions so much outside of my field of expertise in qualifying? Well, you're just getting started now. <laughs> So obviously, uh, you spent the last six weeks in, in, in Canada, and you spent time in Ottawa and Quebec City. I mean, it's a bit of a guess, but what do you think is going to happen in the next four or five years? Is Canada going to, through a change in government, and maybe a sort of change in society, adopt some of the things that you've proposed in this plan? So when we launched this report on climate change, uh, we were expecting, like, hatred message, climate septic kind of thing. And it is absolutely not what happened. We only got people to say, thank you. It's so good to have hope. And I think there is a real hunger in Canada to stop this apathy and say, we, we, we're not dumbest than the Brazilian and we can move ahead and we will make that thing. And yes, some things will be more challenging, others will be more easing. But overall, we've done great things and now is the time to do great things. So, so I'm very optimistic. And you know, when we started that, people were telling me all the no's. Journalists won't pay attention, politicians won't pay attention, public won't pay attention, uh, Harper will be re-elected. It, it was just no, 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 no. <laughs> and it's not what happened. You know, we have had great coverage you know, with the journalists. People took this, Harper was not re-elected. Uh, <laughs> well, it's true, you know, we're in a very different Canada than we were six months ago. Quite frankly, for us scientists that work on climate change, we're just somewhere else. I've had postdocs scared to write a proposal on climate change because they thought they would not get funded. So we're somewhere else, and I think the government seems, the federal government seems one that want to listen to different opinions and move in a concerted way, and that's certainly what we think should be happening. And I'm not a liberal. <laughs> Not any party. So the last question is a little difficult one, I think. Uh, oh. Miguel has gone through this process of uh, looking at whether we should divest from fossil fuel companies. Uh, it's been a very contentious <coughs> issue, particularly it's been involved with a large number of students who are encouraging Miguel to divest from fossil fuel companies as a way of going to a low carbon economy. And Miguel's Board of Governors came out with a report about two weeks ago that said that it was not really worthwhile dis disvesting, divesting. So the way in which you see people reacting to things, do you think that divestment is a, a reasonable and effective or efficient way of doing things, or is it really not going to produce much by divesting? So I would encourage you to go to our second report, the green one. There's an article by Francois Meloch, Meloch on investing and divesting. Okay, so it's kind of invest, divest 101. It's brilliantly written. Um, so I get most of what I'll see from my discussion with him. Um, divest is a very important part of the things one has to do. Invest is as important. You need to invest in the new technology, in the clean tech. You need to stimulate that innovation. And you need to divest. Now, I was one of the person that advised the board. They did not follow my advice. <laughs> but I said, you also need to be intelligent in your divestment. Suncor, for example, is a company, oil, that is trying to do things well. Suncor is trying to do solar. It's, it's, it's looking at other ways. So there are companies that are in oil that understand there's a problem, and they're trying to do good. So you shouldn't pull out of them blindly. You should look at the different companies. So what I suggested to the Board of Governors was there's something called the Montreal Pledged, I think. And this is all investment should say, what is the carbon footprint of your investment? And I told McGill, you should do that. You just tell your investors, we want the carbon footprint. Then if you have a really bad company, there are some oil company, I'm told, that are saying, we're going to extract that to the last drop, and we don't care. Well, we should just get the money out of that. 
But if there is another company that's trying to do the transition, we should help them because you cannot just pull out of Alberta and let everybody go hungry. This is a transition and there's you know, a need to do that intelligently. The big, biggest mistake for me of McGill was not following through on that Montreal pledge and the communication failure because some of the things they, they say is good, like they will abide by UN responsible investment rule, blah, blah, that's fine. But they've missed the boat on, on saying and on showing that they were forefront leader on that. And to me, that's sad and it's, it's hurting us, me, because if we want to say, oh, McGill, we're like on the forefront of fighting climate change, we say, well, some of us are. You know. And so, to so it's really selective divestment. That you're it's having. selective divestment, yes, and, 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 and visionary investment. Well, thank Kathleen. Thank you very much indeed for your input. Please join me. One last. Uh,